Hey guys, welcome back to Bombchu. I'm Austin, and today I'll be looking at the Humble Humongous Entertainment Bundle, as voted on by our patrons on Patreon. This bundle has 35 games in it. That's... a lot. We'll break this down by each series, figuring out which games from each are worth your time. If any. Let's dive in. Big Thinkers stars Ben and Becky Brightly, who invite you into their house to learn. We have Big Thinkers Kindergarten and Big Thinkers First Grade. Both games share the same house and backgrounds, but items are rearranged so there are different clickable interactions. And it wouldn't be a proper humongous entertainment game without tons of silly stuff to click on. These are fun and entertaining, but that's about where it stops. Your goal is to earn stars, which you do by completing educational activities, whereas in the other games, you're trying to complete an objective, which has simple but cohesive puzzles along the way. Here, you're just doing schoolwork. Match the clock to the time, order the letters alphabetically, match the categories, things like that. Picture the Jumpstart series, but way less fun. Ben and Becky are also probably the least charismatic characters I've seen from Humongous. It's clear why there were only two games in this series. A second grade game was planned, but ultimately never released. This is really only suited for small children, and even then, the software is really outdated. Unless you played this as a kid, in which case, maybe the Brightleys hold a special place in your heart. The Let's Explore or Junior Field Trip series is a step forward and a step back. For one thing, this series is pretty much all about clicking on stuff for fun interactions, arguably the bread and butter of Humongous. However, you don't have much of an objective. You have a button to find more information on an object or animal, which gives you an encyclopedia entry. There are a few mini-games to play, but these mostly stay the same across each game, with the trivia quiz, coloring book, and some other simple games like that. Each game does come with one themed minigame, but these are super simplistic, like catching chicken eggs on the farm, or getting luggage to the right bin at the airport. We also have an animal mascot in the form of Buzzy, who isn't overly annoying and has a cheerful design. Not in the top list of humongous characters, but certainly better than the Brightleys. The trips we get here are the airport, which lets you check out different types of planes and helicopters, as well as their controls, the farm, which lets you look at barn animals and such, and last is the jungle, which shows off the jungles of Asia, Africa, and the Amazon. The unfortunate part about this series is that you really don't get much direction. The purpose is for you to explore and find out more when you really want to. It's aptly named, a virtual field trip. More interesting than big thinkers, but we can definitely do better. Fatty Bear's Birthday Surprise I had this with a putt-putt game when I was a kid, and while putt-putt worked fine, I never did manage to get past the title screen of this game. Something about it just wouldn't work with my PC back then. Considering Fatty Bear has one game to himself and an activity pack with putt-putt, I didn't expect much from this game. But to my surprise, it shares a very similar style with Putt-Putt Joins the Parade, one of my favorite childhood games. The art style, the music, the interface, it's cool to see another game in this style. Putt-Putt games changed over time such that none of them felt just like the original. You are a teddy bear, and the child you belong to is having a birthday, so your job is to make a cake and set up a fun birthday for her. There are some simple puzzles to help develop perception and memory, and a clear objective in mind. Oh my gosh, so many fun things to click on. This is where we're getting to the decent games in Humongous' library. As far as the character, Fatty Bear is fine. He's got fun animations, and he's a walking teddy bear. However, he's kind of too goofy to want to pretend to be as a kid, and he's a bit old to play as imagining yourself in the role. And I think Humongous knew this when their biggest franchises formed into Putt-Putt, Pajama Sam, Freddy Fish, and Spy Fox. Still, if you've enjoyed a game from one of these series, this one is still worth a look. Spy Fox has you playing as a secret agent fox solving major crises, such as the world running out of milk in the first game, Spy Fox and Dry Cereal. This shares the point-and-click style of the other games here, but it's for a bit of an older audience. There's a lot of story, and puns flying constantly. It's not always immediately clear where to go, and there's less hand-holding. Unfortunately, this also seems to mean less fun stuff to click. There's still stuff there, just a lot less. Dry Serial came at a time when Humongous was changing to a new animation style, which was less pixel art and more cartoon drawings pixelated to hell. It's not an art style I like. 
and this was about the time I quit playing putt-putt games. Spy Fox 2, Some Assembly Required, shares the same look and feel, though it seems the writing team decided to replace a lot of the puns with Spy Fox being conversationally dumb. I had a lot less giggles on this one. Still a strong focus on story, though I must admit they did a lot more animation work on this one. There are some impressive scenes in comparison to many other humongous games. Still, the story sequences go on for a while, and I found myself wondering when I'd get to play the game. Spy Fox 3 solves some of this by starting you off almost immediately with a short puzzle, and getting right back to the puns and references. Story is a focus, but scenes are shorter and broken up more with gameplay. And hey, there's really something at stake. A giant aerosol can is spraying at the ozone layer. That does it for Spy Fox Adventure Games, but there are two more arcade games to look at. Spy Fox and Cheese Chase has you riding a motorcycle, picking up cheese, and gas so your bike doesn't run out of fuel. You move the mouse to move Spy Fox, avoid obstacles, or don't, there doesn't seem to be much punishment. There's minimal animation, pretty much no puns or story. This one is extremely basic, and maybe should have been part of a collection of minigames. Spy Fox and Hold the Mustard had a bit more effort put into it, with a well-animated cutscene, puns, and a story behind what you're doing. Though it doesn't really match up with the name of the game. King Konglomerate is trying to rid the world of ketchup. Hold the mustard? I don't know. You fly around destroying drones that are trying to steal tomatoes. Again, super basic, but I could have seen myself wasting some time with it when I was younger. All in all, Spy Fox isn't my cup of tea, but at the right place and time in my life, I think we might have meshed a little better. Pajama Sam follows a kid named Sam who wants to be like his favorite superhero, Pajama Man. Things get off to a great start with Pajama Sam and no need to hide when it's dark outside. It's your first night going to bed with the lights off, and when things get a little too spoopy, Sam decides to take on the darkness in the closet. He ends up falling into a night world and has to make his way out. This uses an earlier style of Humongous' cartoony animation, but the bright colors and backgrounds just look really good in this style in a way that Spy Fox didn't. And of course, we have tons of stuff to click on. Pajama Sam 2, Thunder and Lightning Aren't So Frightening, follows the same structure. Sam is afraid of thunder, so he heads up to the attic and ends up in a weather world to deal with it. Pretty consistent. And again, I could just eat up these visuals. All these colors give me brain tingles. Pajama Sam 3, You Are What You Eat From Your Head to Your Feet, is where things start to move in a direction I don't love. We're now using Spy Fox style animation with more jagged lines and less frames of animation. Things are still colorful, but I can't really call it eye candy anymore. This time around, rather than being afraid of something, Sam overeats on a box of cookies, so he heads into the pantry and goes to a food world. After attending a party filled with bad foods, he gets tossed into jail for talking about broccoli, and has to find his way out and back home. Instead of being a game about conquering a fear, which is a great fit for a game starring a superhero kid, it's a lecture on eating right, a bit disappointing after those great first two games. Pajama Sam 4, Life is Rough When You Lose Your Stuff, wouldn't start at all. Most of these games got an update this month to make them more compatible with Windows 10, but for some reason, this one didn't. This needs an update, badly. That does it for the adventure games, on to the arcade and activity packs. Pajama Sam's Sockworks is just that airport luggage game with socks instead of luggage. Pajama Sam's Lost and Found has you riding Otto the boat from the first Pajama Sam, trying to find your stuff. You move left and right with the mouse, and click to jump. Avoid obstacles, collect stuff. Pajama Sam Games to Play on Any Day is a collection of typical children's games like Shoots and Ladders, Checkers, Tic-Tac-Toe, etc. All with some sort of spin on the name and theme. Despite these all being games you most likely had in your closet as a kid, this activity pack at the very least had some effort put into it, and I can't say the same about the arcade titles. Overall, I think Pajama Sam is a solid character, with a fun design and being young and relatable to kids. Having grown up on Putt-Putt, I think the first two Pajama Sam adventure games would have been awesome to play back when they came out, but I'm still glad I found them now, as I haven't had anything new to scratch that Putt-Putt itch in ages. It's unfortunate the series declined with 3, and I can't give any judgment on 4 while I'm unable to play it, but I'd say the first two games are enough to push Pajama Sam pretty high on the list of humongous characters. Freddy Fish takes us down into the ocean, and boy, do we start with a real problem. In the case of the missing kelp seeds, someone has, well, stolen the kelp seeds. No seeds means no kelp, and without kelp, the fish will all die. Freddy even says this out loud. I don't think there's been a threat of death in other humongous games. 
That's not all. If you change the config file, you can trigger a scene where your buddy Luther gets eaten. Yeesh. This one feels like the animation style of the early Pajama Sam games with less delightful colors, combined with the story focus of Spy Fox. The map is also not great to navigate. There's just arrows everywhere, with no real visual to tell you where it will take you, so you have to kind of just bumble around until you find what you were looking for. The challenges are easy for young kids, it's just a little more tedious to play than some of the other games here. Things improve a bit in Freddy Fish 2, the case of the haunted schoolhouse. A ghost is haunting Freddy's school and stealing toys. Freddy and Luther are on the case. Very similar style to the first game, but the lowered stakes feels a little more appropriate here. Oh, and signs have pictures on them to tell you where they lead now, so that's nice. Oh, also, some of the clickables start musical numbers, and I am not a fan. Freddy Fish 3, 4, and 5 all seem to continue on without any significant gameplay or engine changes, just new adventures. Beyond the adventure games, we have a couple of arcade games, starting with Freddy Fish and Luther's Maze Madness, which is Pac-Man with no ghosts. Freddy Fish and Luther's Water Worries actually takes more than one sentence to describe. You play as Luther with a slingshot and you need to shoot bubbles that come up on the screen. Bubbles that make it to the top lower the water level. Bubbles that hit Luther prevent you from shooting for a bit. Your goal is to collect worms, which fall off of certain bubbles, and then you have to drag Luther over to get the worm without getting bubbled. It's more interesting than a lot of the other junior arcade titles, but that doesn't really say much. Overall, I'm not into the Freddy Fish franchise. It certainly has its fans, and the character design fits well in the humongous library. I even remember kind of wanting to get it as a kid, but I don't know what it is about Freddy Fish. Something about it feels very tedious to me, to the point that I just have no desire to play these. The visuals are fine, the puzzles are fine, it's just, there's nothing I love about it. It's time for the star of the show, Putt-Putt, the purple talking car. This magnificent little guy got his start in Putt-Putt Joins the Parade, a game I have played through at least a hundred times. I have bought this game at least three times, and getting it in my Steam account was the day my Steam library couldn't get any more prestigious. Look at this. Pixel art? Check. Great music and sound effects? Check. Puppy Pal Pep? Check. Paint jobs? Uh-huh. Oh god, yellow, why? And oh my lord, the clickables. So many clickables. This game is 20 minutes of pure joy every playthrough. You can mow lawns for cash. Do you know how satisfying this is? Has motor oil ever looked this tasty to you? Case closed. Putt-Putt Goes to the Moon takes all this and turns it up to 11 by having Putt-Putt accidentally get launched into space. Puppy Pal Pep is here as always, but we find some new friends, including a space rover that got abandoned on the moon. I'm not crying, you're crying. This adventure is a little more involved, with more places to go and things to do. On par with the original, perhaps a bit more engaging. I'd say Joins the Parade is better for when you just want to feel good. Goes to the Moon is more for when you want an adventure. Somehow as a kid, I accidentally skipped Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo, but trying it now, I'm not too miffed about it. Things have been toned back from adventuring to outer space, down to visiting the zoo and looking for baby animals that are missing. This also comes with a transition to the cartoony art style we've seen in most of the other games in this bundle. Personally, I think Putt-Putt looked better in Pixels, and something about these backgrounds feels really weird. Still, it's a Putt-Putt game. Not nearly as strong as the last two, but things pick up a bit and Putt-Putt travels through time. The guy who accidentally launched Putt-Putt to the moon has created a time machine, and guess what? He accidentally sends a bunch of Putt-Putt stuff through time, including Puppy Pal Pep! So you have to travel through time to find it all, jumping between the Age of Dinosaurs, Medieval Times, the Old West, and the future. Each era is distinct and has pieces you need to solve puzzles in other eras. It's decent fun, and a much more fitting sequel to Ghost of the Moon. But even as a kid, I found myself playing this one a lot less than the other two. It just doesn't feel as good. This is where I quit, so these next three adventure games will be totally new to me. Putt-Putt enters the race finally returns us to Car Town, the location of the first game. It's nice to see the old town again, even if some of the details have changed a bit. Your goal is to get Putt-Putt ready for the race by collecting a few things, which will of course involve helping out some of the town members to get what you need. It's a by-the-numbers Putt-Putt game. Except, Putt-Putt's voice actor has changed for the first time ever. Actor Jason Ellison got replaced by Nancy Cartwright, the voice of Bart Simpson. And it's super obvious. The art's changed, the music and sounds have changed, and now the voice has changed. I don't know, this is starting to feel less and less like what I love. Putt-Putt Joins the Circus is more of the same. 
find the items to save the circus acts. Finally, we get one more voice actor change in Putt-Putt, Pep's birthday surprise, where Putt-Putt is now played by Michelle Thorson, whose biggest other credit is playing a horse groomer in the background of an episode of Mad Men. Unfortunately, just like Pajama Sam 4, this title didn't get the update the rest of these games got this month to make it work properly on Windows 10. So unfortunately, I can't play it. But I bet it would have offended me greatly. On to the arcade and activity packs. Putt-Putt and Fatty Bear's activity pack is pretty similar to the Pajama Sam pack, with games like Checkers, Go Fish, and the like. However, it's in the pixel art style of the old Putt-Putt games, and uses similar music and sounds, and big animations. Unfortunately, these lengthy animations make playing each game take a long time, but it was fun to boot up just for some atmosphere. Putt-Putt and Pep's Dog on a Stick plays like Qbert, with no enemies, and you just need to collect all the bones. Putt-Putt and Pep's Balloonorama is Breakout. Overall thoughts on Putt-Putt. He's for sure Humongous' best character. There's a reason he has so damn many games. However, I feel like maybe Putt-Putt got milked a little too hard. It's not that the developers were getting lazy, just too much of what made it special changed along the way. Still, those first couple of games are excellent, with the couple that followed doing a fine job too. I wondered all these years what I had missed from Putt-Putt's other games, and it's nice to finally put that wonder to rest. So what did we learn with Humongous today? First off, they should have stuck to adventure games. These arcade games were really bare bones, and should have just been mini games included in their proper adventures. Heck, some of them were. These games all used the Scum Engine, which was used for games like Maniac Mansion and Monkey Island. Great for its time, and for what it did, which was great pixel art adventure games. But as the years went by, Humongous clung to the Scum Engine when it was far out of date. And they tried some tricks to get their games to look more up to date, but as we saw, this kind of led to mixed results. Finally, while I didn't end up enjoying a lot of these games, likely because I'm not the target age or playing them when they came out, I did get to discover Fatty Bear and a couple of Pajama Sam games that I plan to revisit in the future from time to time. And those will be special to me, because I don't have much like Putt-Putt that I still enjoy to this day. Finally, a big thank you to Gabriel Skaggs, Michael Slater, and all our patrons over on Patreon. Your support means the world to us. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.